All right, here we are back at Advent of Code 2022. Now, Advent of Code is a set of 25 puzzles. Each puzzle usually has a part one and part two, but it's a set of 25 puzzles that you can do in any language that you would want to. And this is what the site looks like. Each one of these puzzles will unlock each day for the next 25 days. And when part one comes out, you can do it, you succeed at it, and then part two comes out after you succeed at part one. Of course, we're getting very close to the puzzle unlocking. Each puzzle unlocks at midnight Eastern Standard Time. And usually there's a giant rush of people to get the first problem done because you get more points the faster you finish each of the problems. Now, I'm doing this to teach you more about Rust, so I'm not going for speed. But there will be people done with this within the next 30 seconds, I can guarantee you. So let's click on problem one and see what we're dealing with. Typically, this is the way it's set up. You click in and you get some really, really long uh, set of paragraphs that describe some problem. You get some input that you're supposed to pass to your program, and then you get a little answer box. So you have to take the input, follow these instructions right here, and then drop your answer into this text box and hit submit and see if you got it right. Everybody gets their own puzzle input. So if I click on this, you can see mine, which is just this really long text file. So let's dig in. I've got a repo here that I usually use. You can see that I have it organized by year and by language. So I'm gonna create a directory called 2022 slash Rust with make dir dash P, which I don't need because I'm using new shell. So I'm just gonna make dir. <laughs> I always forget about that. 2022 Rust. And then we're gonna do cargo new dash dash lib day one. I'm gonna open VS code for day one. And this will give us day one source lib.rs. And I'm also gonna create a source bin part one.rs and a source bin part two.rs. And so I've created a source bin part one.rs. This uses day one process part one, which is a function that doesn't exist right now. And we've got a main function. We're using standard fs to read the input.txt into a string. And then we run process part one on it and we print out the results. And this is generally the scaffolding that I use for all of my advent of code exercises or problems or whatever you wanna call them. Typically, we always need to read in some text file, which in my case, I'll go grab now. So here's a text file. It is the same as my puzzle input. So I've dropped that puzzle input, which is, oh, about 2000 lines of code into input.txt. And in lib.rs, I'm going to do process part one. It's gonna take a string as input, or rather we'll have this take a string slice as input. And I'm not currently testing anything, so I'm gonna comment out the tests. So if I do run, cargo run dash dash bin part one, then we get some input, which Cargo is helpfully telling me that I am not using, and it prints out works. So this project structure is probably new to you. It's not a very super common project structure. Basically, you can have your Cargo toml in this directory. You can have a lib.rs, which will be the library. The name of the library in this case is being pulled from the package name, so it's day-01, except that Rust doesn't use dashes in package names, so it'll be day underscore one when we go to use it. That function can then get pulled into any file that's in bin, which will allow us to run it with cargo run dash dash bin and then the name of the file. And what I'm gonna do is actually run a cargo watch dash x run dash dash bin part one, which will keep running this file every time I make changes. So let's go ahead and take a look at the problem and see what we actually have to do. And now you see why I'm not going for speed as well, because if we click the leaderboard, I've been making a video for eight minutes and there are already over 200 people or already over a hundred people, as it were, done with the first problem. So usually there's a bunch of text here that is some story about the problem. But if you skip all that, you can scroll down to this section here, which says, for example, suppose the elves finish writing their items calories and end up with the following list. So a list of three numbers, then a number, then a number. The list represents the calories of the food carried by five elves. The first elf is carrying food with 1,000, 2,000, and 3,000 calories, a total of 6,000. The second elf is carrying one food item with 4,000 calories. Third elf is carrying food with five, 6,000 calories, which is a total of 11. So each of these groups is one elf with a number of items that add up to be calories. In case the elves get hungry and need extra snacks, they need to know which elf to ask. They'd like to, they'd like to know how many calories are being carried by the elf carrying the most calories. In the example above, this is 24,000 carried by the fourth elf. Find the elf carrying the most calories. From the giant list of puzzle input here, which we can now understand, 
we have to get the total calorie count that the elf is carrying and then put it into this answer box. So I've got a couple of thoughts here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is grab this information and temporarily replace my input.txt with that information. So now we're working on the test input and we know whether we get this correct or not. I guess actually the other thing I could do since we're supposed to be teaching you all here, uh, let's say it works and let's say let input equals this string. So I'm gonna replace the input.txt with the actual input that I need to run. I'm gonna kill this running process because we're gonna test instead of running. So right now we've got zero pass, zero fail, zero ignored because I haven't saved this file yet. So we've got the config test attribute macro on top of module tests, which means that this whole module will only get compiled into our binary if we're running our tests, if we're running cargo test or somewhere or something else sets the flags. Use super colon colon star will give us access to everything in the parent module. In this case, the parent module is this file since tests is a sub module of the current module in this file that we're working in. The test macro lets us know that this regular function is a test. We've named it, it works, where I've set the input to the test input that the web page gave us. And then I'm taking the process part one function, I'm running it on this input, getting the result and testing it against what output we should get. So back to the problem. Well, let's save this first. And it doesn't compile. In this case, I'll make this a string. And right now we have a failing test. So we're getting works from it. And on the right hand side, we've got 24,000. So we have our failing test now. So two approaches that I can think of to this, we can either use iter tools and try to group this. We could also split the entire thing by new lines and then iterate over each batch and add those up after parsing them, which is probably what I'm going to do, I think. Or we could go each individual line by line. And as long as it successfully parses, add that to a running total. And then whenever it doesn't parse, finish that total. But I think what I wanna do is keep all the information around because part two tends to depend on information from part one. Okay, so we've got a passing test here. So to go over what I did, I took the second approach that we talked about. I chunked up the input, so we can see the input on the right here, into or by new lines. So there's a new line here from 3000 to the empty line, and there's another new line from the empty line to the 4,000. So taking that whole file, we can split on the double new line because that is a unique separator. And then we can map over every entry. Each of those is going to be just a list of numbers. So we can take that list of numbers and we can split it on a single new line. And I'm just remembering that there's also lines here, which is probably more performant. Although for the small input that we have here, it almost certainly doesn't matter. But all the same, much better to not have to type a uh, backslash n and potentially mess it up, much better to use dot lines. So the elf load is the all of the items here. So we chop those up into lines, we map over each line, parsing each of them. This should never fail, so we're going to unwrap it. Parse returns a result. I'm using the turbofish syntax here to specify what type I want parse to parse into. The turbofish syntax being colon colon, these open and closing angle brackets with the type that we're targeting in the middle. And that's before we do the function call with the parentheses. And all this is doing is telling parse that we want it to try to parse into a U32. Of course, parse returns a result. So we do have to unwrap that. And you'll see that as we do advent of code, I do unwrap things in arbitrary places, especially when we know the input is well formed. That means that I know that at this point in the program, all of those numbers, are going to be valid U32s. And if they're not, then the program should crash because there's something really wrong. Of course, since we have an iterator, we can sum. And because there's really nothing else to tell it what to sum into or what type to sum into, I tell it to sum into a U32 using the turbofish syntax again. Because Rust is an expression-based language, this expression or the result of it, so the sum of each item, gets returned in this map, which means we get, at the end of this map, the sum of all of the elf loads for all of the elves. And then we can do a dot max because that's also an iterator. Dot max returns a result itself because you could potentially have an iterator, for example, that only has one value or no values or something like that. So we unwrap that result again. And then I do result to string because we're returning a string from the function. And you can do that on a U32. And that gives us the correct answer of 24,000. So now if I run the bin for part one, we get 69,528. And as long as I haven't done anything wrong that isn't in the input, that should give us one gold star. 
So we get a gold star and we get to continue to part two, which opens up another question on the same page. So every time that we complete part one, part two of Advent of Code tends to twist it in some way that requires you to either return more information or use more of the information. So it can be really good to not over optimize when working with part one. In this case, the change is that we need to get the top three numbers and we need to sum the top three elf loads to get the new value. So let's write another test here. Fn part two works, and this is the number we need. And I'm going to copy in, I think this whole thing here. Well, if I'm gonna copy this whole thing in, then I can take this and I can make it a const instead. Remember constants in Rust always need to be typed. You always need to give them a type. Um, it's also conventional to do something like this and uppercase it. So I'll uppercase that. And then I will process part one input here. And I will take the same code that we wrote there and put it here, except this is going to be 45,000 and this is gonna be process part two, also a function that doesn't exist yet. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start from our part one code and I'm going to do process part two here. The other thing I'm gonna do is save this part one file as part two and change the name and save that. So we have the same scaffolding here that reads in that input file and then runs process part two on it. Of course, I misnamed the file, so I do have to add the dot here. And then we're back into lib.rs working on process part two. So basically, we've already mapped over all of the elf loads at this point. So all we really need to think of is how to get the final three items. Or rather, we need to sort the iterator and then get the top three items. Now, there is no sort function on the iterator trait in Rust. And I'm not intimately familiar with why there isn't although I could take a guess. So I do know that there's a sorted function in the iter tools crate, which is definitely a crate that we'll use later on. But for now, what I think I'll do is just collect. So we've collected into a vec of U32s, and I've chosen to not specify the type here in the collect because I already specified it in this parse and in the sum. So I think we'll make this mutable and we'll do result.sort and I'll return some fake failure result for our function for the moment. Now let's take a look at result. So if I run test and I scroll up, we can see that the biggest numbers are at the back, but the results being at the back is kind of not my favorite because we do want the top three, so the biggest three. So let's go with a sort by. So here A and B are gonna be U32s and our job is to compare them. If we compare them normally, we could do A.comp B which will compare them in the same exact way we just had and should result in the same output. But if we reverse that and we do b.comp a, we end up with a reverse sort. Comparison is built into the Rust language and there are a number of traits and other things that you can derive such as ordering that define how an ordering should exist. And as you might imagine, ordering contains an enum of or ordering contains variants of less, equal, or greater than. So what we return from comp here is one of those variants, whether it's less, equal to, or greater than. With the results sorted how I want them, I can use result.iter with take3.sum, which will hopefully do what I think it will. <laughs> we do have a compilation error, and the issue seems to be that the type annotations are needed for sum. So we'll name this a U32 again, and scroll down and it looks like we're passing. There we go, two passed. We've got part two works and it works, which is the part one. So we didn't have to use any third party crates. We used basically the same solution as we did in part one. So we're splitting over the input. Again, I'll show the input on the right here. That's this. So we're splitting on two new lines. That gives us an iterator over all of the groups of numbers. We map over that which we're calling elf load for each of the groups. We split those into lines, which gives us each of the numbers that we can map over. We parse those into U32s, which can fail, so we're unwrapping, which will panic if we are unable to parse. But because this is well-formed input and it's like a puzzle competition, this is going to be fine. We then sum that and we tell Rust that we want to sum into a U32. We return that from this map, which means we get the summed loads for each of the elves, which we collect into a vec. We collect it into a vec and we make the variable mutable because what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort that vec. And we're not just gonna sort that vec however it wants to, we're gonna sort that vec high to low. 
And to do that, we're going to use sort by instead of sort. This gives us the pre first value and the second value, or two arbitrary values, which we're going to compare in reverse. So we're going to say, is B greater than, equal to, or less than A, instead of saying, is A greater than, or equal to, or less than B. This gives us a reverse sorting of our VEC. Again, the value returned from CMP, unlike other languages where you might be returning like one, negative one, and zero, this returns an enum of less than, equal to, or greater than. So we have our sorted VEC, which means that the biggest three numbers are at the beginning. We can iterate over that, take three of the numbers off the iterator, and sum them to get the answer. And then we two string that to return it from this function. So with all of that, I should be able to cargo run bin part two and get our answer. And if we put it in here, we get the right answer. So we have two gold stars for today. If we check out the leaderboard, we are not on it because they got done a long time ago while I was making the video, but I can view my own personal stats. So you can see how long it took me to make the video if you want to. <laughs> it took me about 40 minutes with about, I guess, 20 minutes on part one and 20 minutes on part two. But you can see that even taking 20 minutes puts me at rank 9,000 out of the groups of people that are trying this. If I go back to the homepage, you can see that the next question, number two, unlocks in 23-ish hours. And I've got two stars for number one, which means I've done part one and I've done part two. So again, I am doing this to teach you more about Rust. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. If you would prefer, I take a different approach to the questions. If you'd rather just see the answers or the process or more of anything else, let me know in the comments. The link will be in the description to this code, and I'll catch you tomorrow for problem number two. Have a great day.